Bible Church Online. I just want to invite you to prepare your hearts this morning to worship our Lord and the King, God of heaven. Glory to him. i uh-huh. 
Lansing, Michigan, as around 300 protesters, some of them armed, convert people waiting in line for hours. This is a crisis, a pandemic, an epidemic, or whatever you want to call it. Tonight, anger in the streets across America. Massive crowds gathering again. Now surpassing 4 million, the total doubling in only six weeks. In New York, a city still on lockdown. Many are making their voices heard despite the risks of the pandemic. In Florida, where cases are surging. You can see the smoke continuing to billow as many, many buildings are on fire. Are, quote, increasing the strain on the health care system. And of that city burn. We live in a society that still sees new COVID concerns as protests in the middle of the pandemic. The shattered glass from a night of rage. Across the country, an ominous pattern. A potential breakthrough in COVID tracking. This California reports its highest number of virus deaths in one day. All that has just been either broken into or burned to the ground. This day, California filled with Dr. Anthony Fauci's and take a little look at this scene. Another land of the city. Life. Greetings from Grace Bible Church. Thank you for joining us today as we worship the Lord and open his word. My name is Steve Rowe, and my wife is Deborah, and we moved up to Silver Lakes in May of 2018. One of our joys has been fellowshipping here at Grace Bible Church. Um, we've had the privilege of participating in some small groups. Uh, we love the worship. We're edified through the preaching. And uh, it, it's a rather, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a downside to our experience in Silver Lakes that we're in this COVID-19 experience. The world is literally experiencing so much crisis today. And... Uh, I do look forward to when we can have gathered fellowship. And that's basically what I want to talk about today because when I was invited to give a message and I began researching it, I realized that when we talk about wisdom and friendship, I needed to understand the basis for that and what it means to me as a Christian. What does God expect? How can I really experience that? Certainly radical wisdom for radical times is right now. We need to wise up. And as I studied this, I began to see what my priorities in life needed to be. We've defined wisdom as an, ex an ex expertise in dealing with the difficulties of life. And uh, the season of life certainly qualifies for that. Wisdom is for daily living, not only in good times, but in bad times, prosperous times. And this is that challenge today to all of us. And what I realized was um, we need God's guidance. We need him to, get, to navigate through all this. And that's why we bring up the need for wisdom. But where do we go with that? Where, where this research took me was that I began to see is that, you know, Steve, you need to remember what the basics are. What are the principles that serve in every generation, in every place, and for all time? And basically what I'm sharing is some things that the Lord has spoken to me about my life and how I live out the Christian life, and then some other things that uh, certainly come from Scripture and show the truth behind the, that, and what even others have written, uh, both secular and Christian, about the need for friendship and the wisdom of uh, applying that to our life. It's probably been one of the greatest challenges of COVID-19 that we can grow or experience friendships. Um, but what are the priorities then? What did I realize 
When I come back to the basics, I realize that Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 really is a, a compass for me. It says that I need to trust God, that I need to submit myself to him. Uh, the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, lean on him, and he will direct your paths. He'll make your paths straight. So Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is an always sort of thing. It's a way we can always gauge things in our life. Are we doing it God's way? Are we trusting him? Doing what he shows us to do is evidence of trust. Now, I'm gonna be going over a lot of things here that aren't gonna be new, but I believe, at least in my own life, it was very important that I'm reviewing these things now and being reminded because we're not gonna be in this COVID situation always. We're gonna change, we're gonna move out of this. And uh, so as I think about wisdom and me applying God's word and friendship and fellowship, so I'm reminded that God calls us to love him passionately, to love others like ourselves, so how does that work out in my life? How, does it, how is it fleshed out? To me, it start, well, I have to look at my relationship to the brethren, the church, my brothers and sisters. Uh, Jesus said that a new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. You know, it's so easy to know that but not to really be uh, reflective and intentional about doing it, improving in it, growing in it. But it's so important. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So how does that happen? How does the church become that? There is so much that can be said about the church and uh, one thing that seems very basic is that the word in Greek meant an assembly, people that gather together in a community. So God never indicated that it's something that we pursue as individuals. It's so easy in our culture, our background, to think of my Christianity as just the me and God thing. But that really isn't how God has designed it especially during COVID-19, it's pretty much forced us into that sort of thing with the exception of doing things online. <clears throat> so how does it happen? Where's the starting point? How can I be intentional about loving? I believe that it's evidenced in not forsaking the meeting with other Christians. Now I know we've been challenged at that. I know that uh, this has been a very difficult time in terms of getting together. But he says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together. As some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, all the more as you see the day approaching. If we're not gathering, how do we encourage? Uh, in, in, 1 Corinthians 14, 26, Paul writes, when you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. How does that happen in a time like this? We're reminded that uh, as a priority of scripture that uh, the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. We've been limited in how we can do that right now, but it still shows us the priority. And as we move out of COVID-19, I need to be reminded that that's what God has called me to. It's in the way that we could probably most safely do that is to move into, participate in uh, small groups. Aside from meeting at the church, I see my role as 
being intentional about, about meeting in small groups again. Um, worship online is good. It's creative response. But you know, that isn't the only opportunity I've had to be able to meet. I confess, I realized as I searched out my own life that during this COVID-19, forgetting some of these basic principles of church life, I realized how infrequently <clears throat> I had reached out to anybody. How I basically lived my life feeling that I had a good reason not to expect anything beyond what I was doing or expect anything out of fellowship. After all, we couldn't gather. My intentionality was very low. I was leaning on my own understanding to bring it back to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I didn't apply wisdom in how to live life during this crisis. I yielded to the barriers and I accepted them. Do I have excuses? Well, they're probably not legitimate. I did feel tired. I've done an increased number of Zoom calls to missionaries that we maintain contact with through all of the world as we work with them. There was a lockdown. But you know, right now, excuses aren't what I need. And I'm not, I'm not sharing this to induce uh, shame or guilt, but to give a sense of reminder of where we need to go, where I need to go into the future. How can I go forward? Well, I know that I can do something to move forward right now. You know, Pastor Dave has uh, graciously and uh, extended an invitation at the end of these messages to contact the church if we're interested in gathering in a small group context through video. Well, you know, I've, every message I watched, I have the intention, I thought I need to do that. Every single time, I didn't do it. I never called the church, I didn't email. I found out that apparently I wasn't alone and I, I hurt about that and I thought, wow, when fellowship is some, something that's so integral to the Christian life, why would we not seek something that is at least available as serving for fellowship when we can't personally gather together? I want to stay on the sense of what my priorities are. And uh, I realize that all of us need fellowship. That's how God created us, whether we have it on, even if we have to take it on way of Zoom. A Christian psychotherapist and author, Larry Crabb, in his book, Healing for Ourselves and Our Relationships, Connecting, a radical new vision wrote, a healthy community is built on friendship. Well, I didn't do much to strengthen friendships during COVID-19. He says, a healthy community is built on friendship, on people who are committed to the art of caring engagement, an art that only the gospel makes possible in its richest form. What have we been missing out on? Well, we haven't been sharing our struggles as much as we used to, I suspect. We haven't had as many opportunities to encourage each other, which we're called on to do. And neither have we been exposed to the uh, prayer needs that have arisen during this time. As a body, I'm saying. <clears throat> like we were used to doing when we met personally in small groups. So we miss out on these benefits. You know, science is discovering there's other benefits to friendships. A Harvard study concluded that having solid friendships in our life even helps promote brain health. Friends help us deal with stress, make better lifestyle choices that keep us strong and allow us to rebound from health issues and disease more quickly. Friendship is equally important to our mental health. So isn't that interesting? And God's designed that in living together as the body of Christ. You know, I talked to my wife about uh, a real close friend she's, <clears throat> she developed while we were in Brazil. And uh, I asked her, really, what, what is that friendship like? What, what characterizes it? And she said, you know, whenever we chit-chatted, 
We just seemed to be that we were on the same wavelength. There was mutual edification. We were seeking the same things. Authenticity. We avoided superficiality. There was a depth. Shared common experiences. Questions. We focused on scripture, not merely as a band-aid, but a personal wrestling and application with scripture. Just not head knowledge, but heart knowledge. You know, friendship is a true gift from God. How many of us don't really need or desire or long for what Deborah has in this special friend in Brazil? And I'm sure many of you have this type of friendship. You know, some of our friendships go back a long time. I know recently I, I thought, you know, interesting, talking about friendships, uh, how, many, how many friendships, how friends do I have on uh, Facebook? And I found out I have 632 friends on Facebook. Now, we know that that doesn't mean authenticity nor intimacy or, or really face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, a man who wrote The Care of Souls, Captivating the Pastor's Heart, wrote the following. In our digital age, we're sim swimming in gigabytes of data, but thirsting for reality. We're drowning in information, but starved for genuine community. Technology links us instantaneously with people all around the globe, yet paradoxically, the more information we get and the more virtual connections we acquire, the more isolated and lonely we become. Science is discovering what we see as being true in God's word. You know, we know that we're made in the image of God and God is even a relational God in himself, and he's created us to be re relational as well, not to remain isolated from one another. And research suggests that friendships can help us find purpose and meaning, actually stay healthy and live longer. The intimacy, support, equality, and emotional bonds we have in our friendships are very unique. And I just have to believe, as I believe you do as well, that God expects us to find this, cultivate it, learn about it, seek to live it out within the body of Christ. I'd say the friend that I've had the longest in my life is <clears throat> a guy I met after I got out of college about 47 years ago. He's a unique man. Uh, he pursues friendships with other men. Uh, he's a fine Christian man. He's a businessman. We are very different. But I called him up and I wanted to ask him. I said, how many friendships do you have? He said, that's a tough question. I'll look at my prayer list. At least 10 people who are dear to my heart. Oh, 11, if I include my wife. <laughs> there are others, he said, that aren't Christians, but they're not that kind of same closeness. That I don't have the spiritual intimacy with them. And I said, well, what qualifies these friends as uh, being close? in their friendship. He said, we can talk, we can share what's deep and meaningful, we can hold secrets, confidences, we support each other in prayer. Everyone knows that we can call on the other in need, in an urgent situation. You know, he values his friendships with other men. And uh, although I would be away at Brazil as a missionary for years, at a time, when I came home, we would always meet for breakfast. And I found that very up encouraging and uplifting. And uh, like iron sharpens iron, uh, this friend and I have really uh, spurred each other on to grow and to be faithful to God. And the friendship has, has really strengthened that. You know, when we gather with people that share common life cycles, struggle with similar issues. It's amazing how much wisdom, all that we can learn from other people. Um, one of the books I, was, I began reading as I prepared for this was uh, called The Friendship Factor by Alan Loy McGinnis. I'd recommend it to anybody. He's a Christian a psychologist. And he said, in research at our clinic, my colleagues and I have discovered that friendship is the springboard to every other love. Friendships spill over 
into other important relationships of life. People with no friends usually have a diminished capacity for sustaining any kind of love. So those who learn how to love their friends tend to make long and fulfilling marriages. They work well on business teams and they enjoy their children. You know, isn't it interesting that men seem to struggle more with relationships than women do? Um, some of America's leading psychologists and therapists were asked how many men ever have real friends? And the bleak replies were not nearly enough and too few. And most guessed that it would be about 10% of men enjoy close friendships. Another man observed that millions of people in America have never had one minute in their whole lifetime where they could let down and share with another person their deep feelings. I hope this is an indic indicative of the church or of the body of Christ. I know it's not, but I think it's cause for uh, concern that it should draw our attention to this issue. Can we experience when we get, gather together? Uh, can we be intentional? Can we cultivate here at Grace this kind of genuine fellowship that is built on friendships? I believe you're with me when I say I believe we can do it. And I'm not looking to the past and assuming that it hasn't happened. I believe it obviously has happened. As a person who's only been here for a little over two years, though, I need to move in that direction to allow it to be created in a deeper way in my own life. You know, we can seek to live like Jesus lives. We seek to obey him, to love as he loves. We can seek to live as he lives. Jesus placed great value on relationships. He chose to spend much of his time deepening his connections with a few significant persons rather than speaking to large crowds. What is more, his teaching was filled with practical suggestions on how to befriend people and how to relate to friends. You know, what's an interesting thing about love, uh, Catherine Ann Porter, a psychologist I believe, wrote, love must be learned and learned again and again. There's no need, there is no end to it. Hate needs no instruction, but wants only to be provoked. And you know, friendship as, as love is something we need to learn and be intentional about, be conscious of. So I've come to a place where I'm reminded, it's not the first time in my life, but I'm at a place in life where I know I need to focus on this. I need to assign top priority to relationships. And it's obviously that when I look at Jesus' life, I can say that his relationships and the love he demonstrated to others was a top priority. We can't talk about, all, talk about all the things that are involved in this, but one I wanted to highlight is that friendship cultivates transparency. So often this is a very threatening sort of a thing, and yet it's something that uh, as Christians we are certainly called to do in our relationship with God. Because uh, as David evidenced, and as many of us, probably all of us, have called out to God at some time or another, we say, search me, O God, and know my heart. T Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offense, offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That same intentionality that we construct with God I believe he wants to flow over into our relationships, our close friendships with other people, relationships that we can form and enjoy and experience in as we gather in the body and meet in homes over fellowship. We need it with each other, of course. Uh, Paul wrote, therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are members of one body. That's a search for transparency, honesty. Uh, the Bible has so many things to say about friendships, um, but we can spend so much energy erecting 
uh, keeping our masks up, erecting facades so that people can't really know who we are because we feel so threatened. And sometimes we can even wonder, would people even accept me if they knew what I know of myself? I'm not saying this means we have to be a, you know, totally spill everything all the time to everybody, but healthy transparency is, is a quality in healthy living and good friendships. You know, whenever we take off our masks, others are drawn to us. So the invitation to transparency in relationships and fellowship is really an invita- invitation to auth- authenticity. In our fellowship together, we can find the security to trust each other, trust others with our weaknesses. We can give up wearing facades, take off our masks, and find the liberty from having to exert all that energy not to be known. It's called self-disclosure, but it just doesn't happen automatically because we meet. We cultivate it, we're intentional about it. Even Paul was very transparent about his own weaknesses. He's, he shared in Corinthians 11, 2 Corinthians 11, if I must boast, I will boast about the things that show my weakness. He said, when I'm weak, when I'm strong, I'm strong. You know, science is even discovering how God created us to function in a healthier manner. Uh, we know that sin, uh, that we're broken because of sin and pride, and we know that uh, these are mitig- mitigating uh, characteristics of our, our own natures, carnal natures. Um, sin has corrupted our world as well as our hearts. But as Christians, we know that Jesus can give us life and abundant living. In his book, The Transparent Self, psychologist Sidney Girard relates some illuminating studies on the subject of self-disclosure. His major finding is that the human personality has a natural, built-in inclination to reveal itself. When that inclination is blocked and we close ourselves to others, we get into emotional difficulties. He concluded that honest, honesty literally can be a health insurance policy, preventing both mental illness and certain kinds of physical sicknesses. Isn't that interesting? So we're called not to be complacent, but to pursue this kind of quality of fellowship. In Jesus' life, one of the most winsome and distinctive aspects of his life is that he modeled transparency. He lived visibly before his disciples. I remember the passage when he invited them to come to see where he was living. He spent a lot of time with them. He ate with them, shared meals with them. He wept with them. He helped resolve their quarrels. He prayed for them. He he showed the anger that he felt at the temple. Uh, He was intensely involved with their common life. He shared so much with them and taught them. Uh, It was deliberate self-disclosure. And he called them friends, not servants. He said, I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. So as we consider this vital quality of friendship and fellowship, transparency with one another, our Lord seems to be saying uh, that if we're mere acquaintances with people, as we move along the road of transparency, we are on the road to becoming closer friends. It's interesting that when we see how the woman at the well responded to Jesus revealing what was really going on in her life, uh, that she seemed to uh, have a sense of relief about being known by Jesus. You know, I believe it's an experience of grace. I believe it's an experience of unconditional love. In a sense then, isn't it a fleshed out experience of the gospel? You know, we know many other qualities that would enrich friendships. We don't have time to go into all of them today, but you know, we know that as we are people in experience, love that is patient, love that is kind, that's not envious, that doesn't boast, that isn't proud, that doesn't dishonor others, that isn't self-seeking, that isn't easily angered, that doesn't keep a record of wrongs, doesn't delight in evil but rejoices with truth, protects, 
trusts, hopes, perseveres, who, who of us won't experience enriched living, gospel living, as we experience those sort of qualities in our relationships? And aren't those qualities that should be evidenced in our fellowship, the life of the church? Aren't those the qualities that we want other people to see that when they see we love each other and they see these qualities, they know that we're disciples of Christ, that we follow him, that we merely don't proclaim him in word, but we live it out in deed and in our real relationships. It'll involve encouragement, edification, mutual support. All this pleases God. You know, God is pleased, he says. He's pleased. Oh, this is the end of uh, other qualities. But God is pleased. He reveals how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Meditate on that one this week. Are you contributing, am I contributing to a unity in the body of Christ? If God, if it's pleasant and good in God's eyes when we live like that, what is it when we don't? Think about that for a minute. It takes all of us, and the Bible gives a picture of what this might look like as we live it out in community. Ephesians says that, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, of which I'm a part, you're a part, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies. We depend on each other for this. According to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. We need to wise up. We need to realize that this wisdom, the wisdom that we've listened to of how to live life God's way applies to this crisis. It applies to how we're gonna get out of this crisis. Am I trusting him? Am I trusting God for what we've been looking at? Or uh, am I leaning on my own understanding of how I, can, how I think I can make the Christian life work for me? Am I really acknowledging him? Acknowledging his word. Because when I do, I can believe that I'll experience him guiding my paths. And I will be following the way of wisdom. Will you join me as I renew my own personal commitment to this, to these things? You know, at the end of this uh, message, we're going to again see the slide that presents an invitation to indicate our desire together, together. I'm responding this time. Will you join me in that and commit yourself to making our fellowship the kind of fellowship that pleases God, that others see us living in love and expressing unity before the world? It's how we experience the abundant life, and it's what Jesus intended for us to have. Let's pray. Father, as we close this message, I, as well as many, simply, simply want to say, God, I'm asking you to make me a meaningful participant here at Grace Bible Church to help it to become, to increase to move forward as a community of gospel living where love and grace are intentionally cultivated and enjoyed and witnessed by others that they may, might know that we are your disciples, that you might receive the honor and the glory and the pleasure. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.
The seed I've received, 